generalizations of logic machines. Directly over to you, Ryder. Thank you very much. I hope the microphone works. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, before I start with my presentation, I sort of give you uh, some remarks on my person. Uh, I have uh, started studying physics and mathematics in Göttingen when I met the first computing machine in IBM 1690 with uh, Algol and promoted through in Univac 1108. Went later on to Bonn, uh, the GMD, some of uh, those of you who are on software might know about it. The only uh, is, um, computer science research institution in uh, Germany at that time. Then I had uh, several other jobs, including one as a patent engineer. Uh, as a patent engineer, you must know uh, all things from everything, uh, including mechanics, electronics, and my specialty was software. Uh, I was at that time with uh, Siemens uh, until finally I. Uh, um, uh, um, I have uh, uh, retired uh, there some years ago. Uh, I'm going to about, uh, talk about materialization of logic machines. Well, why materialization? That was a term coined by uh, uh, Gisbert Hasenjäger, who was one of the central persons of my presentations. Uh, to make, he uh, coined it to make theoretical constructs to, uh, constructs to appear as physical objects. So uh, that's it. And logic machines, so these are machines in the context of mathematical logic. <coughs> these are not machines designed to work, to do uh, uh, earnest working, uh, to do calculations. And his emphasis was on Turing machines. Uh, that's why I first have uh, to talk about Alan Turing. And I will not spare you uh, some uh, remarks on uh, the working of Turing machines. Uh, those of you who already know it may skip it, but uh, maybe the others uh, uh, may find it helpful because I needed to, <coughs> to tell about uh, the scientific impact of what Hasenjäger did. Okay, that's uh, Giesbert Hasenjäger. I will talk about he, him and his materializations later on. As I announced, the Turing machines are a central part of my presentation, and I will, uh, during the works on these machines, they invented in Germany the so-called register machines, and this will be uh, one of the ending of my talk. <coughs> Turing was in Germany, yes, he was. He uh, spoke German uh, quite well, uh, as opposed to some uh, people uh, thinking. Uh, he was with his father in the Black Forest first. You see the Black Forest here down in... Where is my mouse? Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, you see it down in Germany. In 1934 he had a bicycle tour from Cologne via Göttingen to Hannover. He uh, apparently visited some mathematicians in uh, Göttingen, but as far as I know the history, we don't know really yet who it was. Uh, but for my presentation, it's not relevant. Uh, this was, by the way, uh, the time when uh, uh, Röhm were and uh, the SR were eliminated, so it was very impressive when he uh, said the, uh, the, the um, uh, people who wrote. Uh, about him. Uh, after the war, he was two times in Germany, one at Burg Feuerstein, inquiry on secret communications. He was, uh, at this time, had, he had already made his Delilah machine, and uh, 47 in Göttingen. In Göttingen, they uh, were afterwards building uh, some uh, tiny computers too. So, uh, there's a relationship between Turing and Münster. I d didn't show you Münster on the map. It's uh, in the west. You see, you should uh, see it there. Um, when uh, Turing published his famous article on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem, uh, he received only two requests for reprints. One uh, from a college, uh, from a professor here in England, and one from Münster. You know, uh, most of you should know what the uh, relevance of reprints at that time was. 
you didn't have Xerox copiers or something like that. The only uh, way to get uh, of your own copy for a study of something, you wrote to the author of the article and asked for a reprint. And as far as I know, he was fairly disappointed that he got so few demands for reprints. And uh, it shows that nearly nobody understood but the people in Münster. <laughs> um, they are... Um, oh, excuse me? Yeah. Here you see uh, uh, Professor Scholz, who was just establishing mathematical logic in Münster. And uh, Turing's article had been discussed in his seminar. Uh, there was even an early article on Turing machine published in German already in uh, 1937 that I redistected when uh, I was preparing uh, for the Alan Turing here. And uh, Turing was invited to Münster several times from 1952 on, but uh, he was let us say, not allowed to uh, come to England. He had some excuses why he didn't come, but uh, most uh, people uh, agree that it was because he was not allowed to leave England. Uh, the Turing machine became famous not uh, also because Hans Hermes published a book of uh, computability where the Turing machine had a central role. Giesbert Hasenjäger, about I'm going to talk in detail later on, and his colleague Dieter Redding, who died very early, did run a Turing room, a Turing room in Münster, where they collected all their uh, materialization machines and uh, even some, uh, uh, even that, uh, I think it was also this uh, reprint that was there. And last but not least, but very often emphasized, uh, Hasenjäger was unknowingly uh, Turing's one-man counterpart for the security of the Enigma on the German side. So there are uh, funny uh, relationships between uh, these two. Um, I would like, before I continue, I would like to say something about Alan Turing, my personal view. I think he has deep concern for feasibility or to, for producibility. Many think, uh, people think him of uh, a theoretician, uh, one who is very theoretic. Uh, well, his model of a machine was a programmable <coughs> machine, and uh, so with, an article, with his article on uh, uh, where he created the Turing machine, it was one very uh, uh, useful uh, thing, still near to the reality. Uh, he made the bomb efficient. He didn't build it, that is clear. Uh, he built a novel screen, uh, speech scrambler, the Delilah. <laughs> He specifies a high-speed universal of computer the ACE, to the detail, uh, to the electronic details, not only the, uh, 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 the, the systems, uh, the systematic behind it, and was very frustrated that it didn't get uh, to work. But he knew the details, the electronic details about it. And uh, in 1949, he cared about uh, the uh, trustability of software, a very practical thing. We uh, have never advanced uh, beyond that place uh, that uh, the, the, he had a handbook written for Ferranti which contained a large parts on how to verify that your subroutine is working uh, correctly and this was skipped in later <laughs> editions. So uh, we have, uh, if, if we had taken this over, maybe we had less updates today. Gisbert Hasenjäger, the other person I'm going to talk about the two. Uh, today he lived uh, from 1919 to 20, 2006. I never met him, unfortunately, although I have studied in Bonn for some time and uh, I have uh, read his manuscripts for my, uh, for my lectures. Uh, maybe uh, history had changed, but uh, it wasn't. He was injured in World War II and uh, uh, so he could need not to go to the front again and came responsible for the Enigma security in the German military civil department. He studied and graduated in Münster by Professor Scholz and Hans, uh, Professor Hermes in the Institute for Mathematical Logic and then had his own uh, prof uh, as a professor for log logic and uh, uh, basic scientific research in uh, Bonn. He's already started in Münster building uh, the machines I'm going to present to you. Uh, here is a, just an overview of all the machines I'm going to present today. Uh, a, a logical evaluator, a flexible Turing machine model, a condensed Turing machine model, 
uh, and two machines we have not yet analyzed in detail. Uh, although the old one, uh, the first one of the Turing machines, had uh, really a research impact, as far as we know, uh, the second one is the more uh, uh, be better to show. Uh, so I will uh, devote a uh, devote a longer part of my presentation. This is the first one uh, he built. And it's, he called it Casimir. Um, if uh, uh, at one uh, time, uh, just uh, after the war, F.L. Bauer, who has died early in this year, one of the leading uh, German computer scientists, presented his version, Stanislaus Münster, leave the blueprint, so we have an original blueprint of pa Stanislaus Neuen Patagon. Scholz proposed similar work to Hasenjäger, who went to work. <laughs> As you might see, I will uh, just switch back. If you look <coughs> At, the, uh, at this area here, you see German telephone relays, so-called flat relays. And uh, this was uh, easy to obtain because Münster was an uh, Oberpostdirektion, that is uh, a central administration part for the German Bundespost, who sold them as, uh, uh, when they were out of uh, use. Uh, this was a start with his uh, materialization of logic machines. This was a logic machine. Uh, we still have to analyze it because I suspect that uh, his design is linear with the size of terms, whereas Bauer's is quadratic with the size of terms. If you ever heard about complexity, I will give a bit later on. It's uh, obviously interestingly when you uh, have uh, 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 when you double the term of your, if you have uh, uh, double the effort in uh, electronics or have uh, the fourth of uh, four times the effort. Okay, the next one was the old one where he started. I will take, say a bit more uh, of it later on when you, and I've given you some information about Turing machines. It's a central state machine. It has up, had up to six uh, tapes. Uh, I will uh, evaluate, uh, will detail this later. It was inspired by how one's publication, I think he was from Oxford, Cambridge, I think from Oxford. Uh, who proposed a text representation, and Hasenjäger and Rudding invented counting tapes at the same time at Marvin Minsky, but this will be detailed later if you have more background about it. Now we come to the machine that I will present here in a bit more detail, the so-called minivan. It is a universal Turing machine, something I will just uh, tell you when you know what a universal Turing machine is. More, It has only four states and uh, three tapes. If you look at it, uh, the central uh, thing is in the center and the tapes are uh, uh, arranged around it. Uh, he has shown it in lectures but never really published something about it. I was lu very lucky to find one article uh, later where he described it and after that uh, I even found some of his manuscripts when, uh, when his wife died. The, um, um, you know, there was uh, the mention that it has only four states. This compares to the size matrix. Uh, so, you know, people like to compare things, whether it is better or, or worse. I will come to that uh, later on and uh, tell you why these size measures are, what the scientific discussion behind it is. This machine, I won't talk a bit more uh, than nothing. <laughs> Um, he called it the RTL70, I'll show it to you from the bottom, you see very basically made, uh, and he used uh, the first integrated register uh, logic, uh, the Motorola ones, uh, where you even cannot find uh, data sheets, so if anybody of you has uh, early Motorola data sheets, I would be very interested in, <laughs> even the internet nowadays doesn't uh, provide them. And my old data sheets, I have a really stack of old data sheets, <laughs> don't have them either. Um, it was uh, perhaps rather close to a 1984 paper. You see, uh, it is uh, apparently from 1970. It has four tapes and two states, two states left, the other one had four states, if you remember. And as I said, all, uh, early Motorola integrated circuits. It's an extremely more small machine that's uh, why doesn't go back? Neither back nor forward. And it's 
disappointing. Mm -hmm. Okay, ah, now we are a bit too far. Okay, stay. Yes, it uses the uh, now we are one too far away. This computer isn't as quick as I thought. Okay, this is not yet fully re engineered and understood, so I still have work to be done. And then he had a TTL with Jam. When he, the TTL uh, logic film these came out, he worked with them. And uh, uh, I have no publications found. It's obviously a modular design, as you see here. It's, I call it TTL the TTL because it was on this box. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it is really was a universal Turing machine. And maybe it reflects later concepts worked uh, together with uh, Reading. Well, now we come to the Turing machine as a central part of it. Uh, uh, the practicability of this mathematical model for com computability always tempted people to build machines. Uh, so this one... Uh, oh. My goal in building this project was to create a machine that embodies a classic look and feel of the machine presented in Turing. This is very nice, but it obviously has a full-blown computer in it. And the heart of the machine <laughs> is the so lead right is, so it has the ability to machine. write, it's very nice for read, presenting a Turing machine, and erase from the perhaps in an exposition and for publicity and so on, but it has not no scientific uh, uh, value so far. The same I must true, uh, say to uh, to to, uh, to the uh, Heinz Nixdorf Museums Forum. I forget to mention, or was stood there, that I. Uh, have uh, have a cooperation with the uh, Heinz Nixdorf Museum for uh, Computer Museum in Paderborn. They built also very early a Turing machine, which is a mechanically a wonderful design, as you might see. There it has an endless tape and a fine mechanic that does it, but uh, it is obviously still controlled by a microcontroller who just only moves the parts. It's nice to see, but it has no uh, scientific uh, value, say so, let's say so far. Are you? I hope. Yes, you are right. Ready. Okay, now I'm going to bother you, those of you who need a nap can now uh, uh, do so. Uh, well, this would be the way mathematicians do a Turing machine. They always talk, talk, about, uh, talk about sets and tuples and so on. I will spare it you. I will give you a more basic explanation. The Turing machine has, as all of you should might know, uh, an endless tape, an abstraction of Alan Turing from a book with leaves and lines and letters on it. He said, the fact that it is a book or has pages are irrelevant for my theory. And there has one read and write head where he can uh, read what is on the tape and change what is on the tape. And then, has, this is, so let's say, uh, the, the, well, not, not really the brain. It, it is, uh, these are the recipes uh, for which the machine works. And finally, at the bottom, you see this is the current state. It's a state machine, as uh, the computer scientists say. And the thing works very simple. Uh, if you are in state 1, I have, uh, then you s uh, select all the lines that have 1 in state column. That are two of them. Then you look what is on the tape, it is marked, so the first line applies. This means that you have to move the tape right and leave in state 1. When you continue this, you have a mark 2. After the third step, you don't have a mark, so the second line applies. You go to state 2, because there is no mark, you make a mark. And then because there is a mark, you just stay where you are and put a right in here, hold. But uh, that is the basic operation of a Turing machine. So we have an infinite tape with symbols. We have a read-write or mark. Uh, well, in the original Turing uh, paper, you could write any symbols on it. It had just a, a set of symbols. Uh, we uh, will go uh, from now on mo mostly to uh, binary Turing machines where you can write uh, or not write onto it. That helps some, uh, in some places. It could move left or right, or one field only at the time. And uh, uh, in the middle is a finite state machine. It is important that this machine is finite, so it has a, a definite number of rows and columns. But yet you can, uh, with the infinite tape, 
uh, do anything that is uh, infinite. The state table represents the machine, uh, as you see. You can uh, plug it in and out and you get different machines from it. That's very important because uh, Turing found a way to uh, treat this table. This was a state table from the previous slide that you see in the middle. Now you can encode this as a number. Well, the one uh, you always have quadruples of numbers. The first is the state number. The second is the, 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 the expected contents. Then what you do, and the new state number. I have arbitrarily shown you no use the three and four for n and y, but that's not relevant. But you see, it's a number. Now we could argue I could write a Turing machine on my tape as a number and do anything that I could do with a number. And this led to the universal Turing machine, where uh, I have one fixed machine that couldn't do everything by reading the other machines. I will show you that you on the next uh, uh, graphics. On the left hand side, something red, yes, it's fairly red. You have the guest description number, the encoding. And the right hand side, you have the arguments and results. And the host machine now goes from left to right, from left to right. It always uh, interprets on the uh, left hand side the machine description and works on the right hand side. But he could uh, first of all prove that this uh, could uh, uh, do anything that any other Turing machine could do. That's why the research concentrates on, on universal Turing machines, not on Turing machines as such, but on universal Turing machines. Um, because this going to and far between the two things is very inefficient. If you uh, ever built a Turing machine like the one I uh, shown before, they will always go to and forth and be extremely uh, inefficient. And that's why uh, it is, uh, 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 you could presume that you simply cut the tape in two. Then you have two tapes. And now obviously your machine is much quicker because you have two read and write heads, of course, but now you can read the program on the one side and uh, execute it on the other side. So uh, this leads to the uh, uh, thing that you can uh, uh, use more than one tape. Uh, some uh, theoretician, theoretical mathematicians say that is unfair uh, and we won't discuss about it, but nevertheless it helps. And. Uh, before I come now to the, uh, with this split uh, tape machine to what uh, uh, Hasenjäger did out of it, I would like to uh, give some uh, extra remarks about uh, Alan Turing. Very few people read his original paper on computable numbers with an application to the entscheidungsproblem. problem, uh, although at least the first part is fairly good understandable if you have some mathematical background. But nevertheless, uh, he found out that a number uh, with, a, uh, with a description number of a circuit-free machine, we'll call it a satisfactory number, that's a mathematical definition. And uh, by the way, it's an endless machine then, and uh, theory has later changed to um, Turing machines that halt. If you look up at Turing machines, you will see the famous halting problem that was none that uh, Turing itself used. And he found out, uh, this is paragraph 8 of his paper, that there can be no general process for determining whether a given number is satisfactory or not. So he has proven uh, what uh, 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 this is the application to the Entscheidungsproblem that uh, Hilbert has 1900 in his famous talk about unresolved problems in mathematics, where he said we can solve any problems in mathematics because uh, maybe we have not yet thought uh, thought enough on it, but uh, this is one. Uh, result that shows no, you cannot prove anything uh, in, gen in general at least. There will be unprovable. And uh, yeah, well, that's what I just said uh, that the Entscheidungsproblem is not solvable. That's why the term Entscheidungsproblem is in this, uh, the title. Now, this was Alan Turing. Now we come to Hasen Jäger. Uh, in one of his articles, he wrote. Even uh, though Konrad Suse had built quite usable computers, we wanted to pursue the idea of constructing a theoretical Turing machine out of our material. That's what he called materialization. Uh, we, want, we have a theoretical idea, we want to have uh, some uh, uh, real machine 
And for all purposes, second-hand relays, those for the German uh, post, uh, were much cheaper. This was from the early register machine. So he created Hasenjäger's old one, uh, which was uh, a plug programmable here, at, the, at, at this plug thing, uh, thing there, uh, and had up to six tapes. When you start splitting tapes, you consider more than one. And uh, after that, because uh, either, well, he had problems with the reliability of the tapes and he uh, decided to make one uh, uh, easy to carry. This is a small, a small universal Turing machine. It's still a universal Turing machine. Remember, you can simulate with this machine any machine. What it consists of, a four-state universal machine in the middle, a uh, uh, state table. Um, in the middle before you see the result tape, that is a, a Turing tape of the uh, simulated machine. On the right hand side you see the program tape, I will show them uh, uh, very soon. On the right hand side you have a third tape, the so called counter tape, which I will explain in a bit uh, later on. And now I will give you some pictures. This is the front view of it. You saw uh, the four rightmost relays are the uh, clock generator, and there are some relays double so that the number of contacts is sufficient. Uh, contacts is sufficient for it. This is the rear view. Uh, not so uh, uh, difficult. Uh, those of you who are engineers uh, may say, "Well, that is not so complicated to be wired." Although it took me a long, uh, many uh, hours on different days uh, to get through it before I found it. This is an, uh, the uh, older version of the really a tape that he used. Uh, you see that uh, uh, coming from front to the back there comes a punch mechanism as a V that cuts out the tape. I will show, uh, you will see it in the film later on working. And uh, here you see a German selector switch. This is a one-way selector switch. But this was the main ingredient for counting for him. Um, when I had analyzed the machine I found out that there was a problem in it. So either the machine had a defect, uh, or which you could repair fairly easy. And if you look at the, my uh, uh, old articles uh, of the, uh, around the Turing year, I will still claim that this was a defect. Later on, uh, when uh, uh, I had with his daughter the chance to look at uh, his uh, legacy, I found a small box where I had a bidirectional selector switch. I never had seen one before, never knew that they existed. From uh, uh, This is the only one I ever had. But it was essential that once I had that in hand, I could understand that the machine was correct. And so I put it on to work. This is a program tape memory. You see uh, this program of this universal machine is very limited to 18 bits to be uh, clear and uh, it has binary to be binary coded. That's the coding that was on the machine. Uh, it depends. Uh, it is not that the one that I use for display now. That is the schematics on my... Uh, well, uh, you shouldn't really read it uh, and understand it now. If you want it, I can send it to you, no problem. Hasenjäger based on two sources, uh, scientific articles. Uh, Moore published 1953 uh, article about a, a simplified universal machine from Moore and uh, basically on how Wang, that's why he called his machines Wang, a variant of Turing theory of computing machines where Wang used instructions instead of state machine we would say uh, today uh, and despite the title it's more than a simple variant but I give you an example what uh, Wang made he said well the first instruction is uh, punch the second is go right the third is conditional, go uh, forward uh, two places and go back and go right, or go back to number two, yes, that's what, what one uh, said. Uh, so, uh, it was a very good solution, uh, but for years nobody studied the compl computational complexity, uh, mainly because uh, this field of research was uh, established only in the 1970s, so it was uh, clear that nobody studied it that way. Uh, Hasenjäger combined Moore with one, uh, three tapes and cyclic tapes. I got hint from publications but no concise descriptions. I, uh, Hasenjäger needed only four states. 
If, uh, so if Monk's solution is universal, so it's Hasenjäger's. We have meanwhile had uh, some uh, scientific discussion on it, and it's clear that Monk's both solutions are universal. And even we had uh, the uh, time and space efficiency, um, uh, some research on it, uh, thanks to an invitation as a fellow to the Newton Institute in Cambridge, where I had a week with uh, two experts uh, on uh, the type of complexity and we found it out. I will give you some example programs now. You know this already, but on the tape you might uh, encode it as uh, R1, the one who goes uh, uh, to the right uh, until it finds uh, the end of it. Encoded, it would read 010001. The jump instructions are the longest. And uh, what I would, uh, this was the wrong key, this is the right key. Here you see uh, what I encoded later on. And, uh, but, uh, uh, so, you will see in the um, running machine later on, there's an extra bit on the beginning, because when going back, it needs to find the end of an instruction, otherwise it would go wrong. But nevertheless, this is, uh, not in a universal machine, I must, I must admit. It is from the conceptual thing in a universal machine, but you cannot do with 18 bits so much, so it was hard enough to find working examples on it. Well, okay, I will now show you the machine in working. Now it punches, you will see. It has to go to some space. Yes, now it comes to the mark. This is the redirector program counter. As you say, you see it goes to and forth as the instructions on the tape tell. This is the central machine. It has the four, tapes, uh, four states uh, lighted by uh, candles and lamps. And this is the counter machine. The counter machine is necessary if you say go back seven instructions that he has to notice somewhere. The go back instruction effectively has uh, Yes. The go back instruction is a variable length instruction and each instruction ends in one and the number of zeros before tells how, much, how far it has to go. Well, so far about this uh, machine. I did uh, some work on uh, size indicators for Turing machines and uh, you, uh, hope you are patient enough that I tell you something about it. Uh, because, you know, um, the number of states uh, seemed to be very small to me when I first saw the machine. And uh, there was a, a publication of Claude Shannon, also a very practical man uh, who built uh, many uh, tiny toys. Uh, a universal Turing machine with two internal states, but he observed that if you want to have two internal states, he has to have many symbols on the tapes. So he found out uh, that uh, uh, the smaller the number of uh, states, the, the larger the number of symbols. And so he posed an important question. An interesting unsolved problem is to find the minimum possible state symbol product for a universal Turing machine that started a challenge around the world and uh, the smaller machines were found. Uh, but the problem is, this is only true for one tape machine. So, uh, I, there were several proposals. I used my own proposal. I will not explain it to you uh, now. But I made a graph out of it. Uh, with, uh, as, uh, yes, you see the uh, uh, the index, uh, so it's a called a complex, something like a, a, a complexity indicator. So more with the uh, initial, uh, yes, it, it is barely readable, the, the thing I will use the mouse to think. Uh, here in uh, 1953 or something like that, Moore made a machine which has a, a rather high complexity number. Then Hasenjäger, when he built this machine that I have shown you, uh, significantly, you saw this is a logarithmic index, uh, significantly uh, uh, go, went down from below uh, 30, and only years after it, there came the machines of Hooper. Uh, several years passed, 
uh, more than about more than 20 years, I see, when Rogozin uh, proposed other ones that were also rather tricky with variable number of tapes, but uh, you see they are not better than half megas, although he didn't publish it. But uh, this type of, uh, as I said, this uh, type of considering the complexity and so on was uh, really uh, not uh, on board when he has made his machine. Uh, there is a, a small machine from Wolfram Research. This one here uh, came here due to the way I calculated it. But uh, there is a, a trick uh, in all these machines. If you invest, if you are talking about two or three states in a machine, it is relevant of you if you have a first, uh, a fourth uh, state as a board state. And many of the authors, including Asmiega, said, okay, we go into a tight loop, like a jump to, to, to the current location to indicate that the machine has stopped. That saves you one state and brings you better on this uh, scale. And uh, Wolfram has a rather complex scheme. I uh, would estimate that the machine, to detect that the machine has stopped, needed at least five states. <laughs> but I am not mathematical enough to prove that. And uh, Neary and Woods, these are the two guys that I worked with at Cambridge, uh, had a really uh, clever solution with some uh, very different uh, encoding on the tapes. And if, we, if I take Hasenjäger's machine and reduce it to three states, which is possible, I get here. So you see that uh, he was really with his machine at the front of the research, but didn't publish it. Now I will take... Uh, 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 in, in the end, a bit about register machines because this, they were a certain outcome of uh, his experiments with uh, his materializations. I hope you uh, remember this picture. What are register machines? They are always also known as Rit uh, Minsky machines because Minsky published an article about them uh, when uh, Hasenjäger and Redding were about to publish their results. They looked at it and said, Oh, what a pity, someone else has already uh, published it. We cannot publish it anymore. Later on, he wrote, we should have looked at the details. They were quite different. We could have published our results, but they didn't. Uh, these are so-called counter machines. Uh, it has an infinite set. Of course, you are mathematical. You are only interested in things that are infinite. A uh, set of counters uh, are 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on controlled by a chain of operations, so we go uh, away uh, from the state machines to machines that know operations. And you have only three operations, so it's really a mathematical model. Uh, you can increment a register, you can decrement a register, and you can, can uh, repeat a loop. And that was one of the things that uh, Hasenjäger's collaborator, uh, Daniel Redding, um, uh, found out, Dieter Redding found out, uh, that uh, you can do it in a structured way. Structured programming was invented, uh, I think, in the... No, Algo already had some structured programming, so it was already uh, known there. Uh, I have uh, uh, notated the uh, um, desktop calculator in the top uh, right to indicate that you have to do counter sets you going up. I will use just another uh, picture here. On the right-hand side, you have the counters of the ENIAC, but the, this doesn't help so much. On the left-hand side, you have uh, uh, coins, uh, towers of coins. And what you do with these machines, uh, when he's, uh, you have the increment, decrement, and the looping. So what you do, you can remove a coin from one of the towers. You can put a coin on the other towers, or you can redo some sequence of it if one of the towers is empty. Uh, no, unless it is empty. So, uh, I have it written in the middle type, is a simple loop would be decrement register 2, increment register 1, unless register 1, uh, increment register 2, decrement register 1, unless register 1 is empty. So this would transfer the number from one register to the other one. Well, that's not quite exciting. Um, because value R1 is lost, so we have put it a bit more complicated. In the first loop, you do, you put the number into register 2, 2. So you increment 2 and 3, decrement 1, unless 1 is 0, then you have the number duplicated in register 2 and 3. And uh, now you can move 
uh, back to uh, uh, register 2. By the way, in this simple loop, you are effectively adding to what is already in register 1, and that's a trick. So you can uh, have a basic addition, and it could be proven that this <coughs> is, uh, can be emulated by a Turing machine, so it is computationally equivalent. Uh, <coughs> and they came to this idea because uh, they had problems making tapes that are changed. They had a great advantage that they had uh, tapes, uh, tapes that uh, are only punched and not uh, erased. You remember perhaps the first Turing machine I shown where there was a rubber machine that erased uh, something. Um, by the way, uh, the original Turing machine only erased the buy notes that he uh, expected. He said, anyhow, I have a tape uh, distinguished in even and odd fields. On the odd fields I make my notes for the calculation on the even fields I release, uh, I, left, I leave the, uh, the final result. And uh, <coughs> the number is a number of steps from the start. So if you just have a tape that you can move around with a perforation in it and have one mark at the beginning, you can, it is a fa pa fairly good counter for you. So these are fairly good machines, uh, especially for pedagogic uh, 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 purposes, but and that is a great problem. Uh, the Turing machine has this very elegant method to store as a universal machine a program in a Turing machine. This is a bit tricky here. The only thing I came over so far was uh, a program uh, to store a program as a powers of prime numbers and uh, then you have to find out if you have to access uh, uh, one part of this uh, uh, storage then you have to do uh, some uh, prime number uh, 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 to divide the number into primes or find out whether this number uh, divides the prime. So this is not very a practical approach and uh, as far as I remember Hazen Diego never did much on register machines. Uh, also this machine was built also, the, you see a, a picture from a, a master's thesis about uh, a diploma about about uh, some register machines. You see the registers here in the middle. Now oh, where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. Here you see the register in the middle. Here, here up you could uh, put in the program as a chain and these are simple operating uh, things. I think this machine exists still but I don't know. It may be in one German university but I don't know really uh, where it is now. Okay. So was this just for fun or was this science? Well, both of it, of course. <laughs> the machines, as Hasenjäger said, were built for no proper use and so far they could not do some uh, commercial work, doing some calculation, even scientific work. Uh, but they were taken as a challenge. Is it possible to boil down the theory to something that really uh, is working that you can hands have hands on? As he said, our bottleneck was a materialization of a Turing tape. Once he found out with the help of the Van Nistle and, and Hooper uh, um, a publication about that, he could do it. It initiated research in Münster on a continued, I think it must, must be continued research on Münster on Turing machines with non-erasable, uh, non-writable tapes even, that these are the register machines. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, some details were published 20 years later, so we have still a lot of work to do. This was the end, but I have to say some thanks. One of the uh, uh, previous director of the Heinz Nixdorf Museums Forum, who uh, during the uh, preparation of the Turing year uh, made me uh, uh, familiarize with these machines and uh, challenged me to find out what these do. Of course, uh, both the families that they preserved these objects so long, you know, they would have gone and many families to the flesh very early. <laughs> uh, the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge uh, for the invitation as a visiting fellow, which helped a lot with the theory behind it. And last not least, Egon Berger, who started uh, me in the scientific field uh, for this uh, stuff. And uh, so, uh, uh, he must be mentioned here too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rainer. If you'd like to have comments and questions, please, if uh, you've got some. Doron. Doron, you?
Um, you mentioned early um, one of your uh, colleagues or the, the, the um, ancestral figures in this history as being um, responsible for the um, Enigma security operation. Yes. Um, the, the myth, if it is a myth in England, is that um, the um, the, that there was no conception that the originators of the Enigma conceived that this thing could be broken. Yes. Is there any evidence that that this belief was intact and that there was no suspicion that the codes were broken? As far as I know, yes, this belief was intact. It was, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, he, he came back injured uh, from the front, so they had to find some work for him. <coughs> and uh, I think uh, because he had uh, some... Uh, uh, relatives who could, uh, especially Professor Scholz, uh, uh, that could say, well, this is a brilliant mathematician, Do, don't you have use for a brilliant mathemati mathematician? And so he came to it, and they uh, thought it was unbreakable, even uh, that uh, this lone mathematician will not find any, any troubles in it. I think he found some minor tweaks, and they changed afterwards the procedures, uh, but uh, uh, well, it is often uh, written, uh, cited by him that he says, uh, fortunately I didn't find more, uh, because it would have ended the war uh, even later. Uh, this was uh, his view uh, many years afterward. But uh, in fact, no, they didn't suspect it. And as I said uh, always, uh, there's a great difference in uh, attitude toward uh, research, at that time at least, in uh, Germany and in England. You trusted your people who worked and worked in Bletchley Park. The science, uh, it is not uh, uh, by chance that it is in the middle between Oxford and Cambridge. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, the German military had a high distrust, not only because many of the excellent scientifics were Jews, but uh, they always thought that this scientific stuff doesn't really help. So he was there as a uh, fighting blood. I don't know the leaf that you have. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to, to do it. Uh, but I don't know details on it and uh, we can't ask him, him himself and I think his daughter will not remember so much about that. Yes? Could I, could I just comment that, that the fact that David Kahn's book, The Code Breaker, addresses this problem and he implies in it that the Germans were fairly well aware that the, uh, the British were having a good go at it, but it was uh, a very bureaucratic system in Germany, spread, with responsibility spread across three different services. Getting anything done was impossible. What? But they had, a, they there were suspicions, and certainly the Germans yeah. knew that the early yes. pre-1939 indictments had been broken. Yes, but on the other hand, you know, uh, when you read about the Enigma, you see astronomical large numbers about the, uh, the combinations, but these are cryptologically irrelevant. The stacker board, which makes some practical problem when you have, uh, after the, the bomb has stopped, to find the real setting, it makes a lot of problems. But uh, cryptographically, any, this is just a permutation, uh, it's, it's, it's not relevant, and uh, I, would, I, I said when we were uh, here on our trip uh, on Turing, I said in Manchester uh, clearly uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the thing that Alan Turing did, he did reduce that many million problem to a problem of some hundred, uh, uh, th some thousand examples that could be machine uh, by mathematics that could be tested with, with a machine. And that was a thing that you they, they, uh, when uh, talking about the security of Enigma, you already had that m million numbers, and cryptography was at that time not yet a real sound mathematical uh, uh, science. And so, uh, any, if someone had suspicions, uh, he uh, was overwhelmed by this number. And uh, nobody saw, as far as I know, if you have un other information, uh, nobody saw that the major weakness was the Umkehrwalze that prevented the one letter to be uh, encoded with themselves, so that they had any a lot of chances to find grips and so on, and uh, this should be explained by uh, experts on Enigma, which I'm not. Yeah? Um, I'm from the Bond legal team, I work with John Harper. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing some work lately, which is relevant to what you just said. If, if you start with an unsteckered Enigma, yeah. then the use of the bomb is much easier. You only need typically four letter pairs in your crib, rather than a longer one. Uh -huh. And this is, I, I, I suspect more people than us knew that. 
if you get a false stop on yeah. such an unstacked menu, yes. okay, it, you, it is much, much more difficult for the checking machine to find out if it's a false stop or not. Okay. Okay, a second stop, checking machine no time flat rejects it, you all know that. Okay. Um, if you have a, a unstacked stop, the only way that we've seen thus far of finding out if it's a first stop or a red heading, you have to decode the rest of the fib message and see if it makes sense. Much more laborious and chancy proposition. Uh, I remember from Prof's book, you know, that uh, that he uh, had some arguments why the staggering is irrelevant. Uh, and this is obviously true for finding the first bomb stop, but uh, I'm not aware if there is some uh, later on uh, he uh, tells, uh, tells uh, how to go back. Uh, so uh, he, I, I read from that that uh, you. Uh, that he doesn't write down later on something about the reverse operation. This, this is work that has uh, only just been done in, in the last couple of years. No, but uh, I, I, I mean, if Turing in, in his uh, book, Prof's book, is a, a, a leaflet uh, a selection he made about uh, using a Turing machine. And there he arguments, he always arguments uh, theoretically too. Um, and uh, he first argues why, uh, I think, as far as I remember reading it, this is many years ago, uh, why uh, staggering doesn't affect his uh, basic uh, algorithm. So I saw that later on he might uh, say something about going back then until I have ignored it, but maybe this is not the case. Okay, thank you. Yes? I was coming back to the Turing machine. Um, yeah. Had Alan Turing not developed this concept of the Turing machine, would it really have made any difference to the development of computing? <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I would uh, turn it the other way around. You know, he was in the US uh, for a longer time and had discussion with all the people uh, there and with uh, John von Neumann and he even uh, guided his paper and so on. Uh, so there was a lot of exchange of ideas. And uh, uh, when he built his ACE later on, I think he depended on that. So it is hard to say uh, whether, uh, whether it have influenced, but in an essence I would say no. Because this is a theoretical construct, it simply showed that Helder's uh, tense problem is unsolvable. And, uh, uh, and so on. And it, it has, be, besides this uh, research on computability, not a real impact on it. Um, but on the other hand, you, I, I think you could argue that he was the first one uh, who had a, a computer program stored on something. Not uh, but it's not practical and it has not influenced the further machine. It has not influenced the ENIAC, uh, uh, his, his concept. And uh, as, an, as an example, what, uh, what to do if you want to brute force for numerical uh, things done at that time and leaving the rest of the university, so uh, his influence was not so great, yeah? I always thought it was John von Neumann who came up with the concept of the stored program issue. <laughs> well, from the papers, yes. <laughs> but we never know what they discussed there. Because, you know, when Alan Turing built his age later on, um, he, this was definitely a stored computing machine, a stored program machine, a stored program machine, yes, and he argues that it can only have that speed. And it even was a machine that has a very clever bootstrap mechanism, where the first instruction read the instruction uh, that should do the further work and then modified the instruction, and so we made extensive use out of it. And uh, I don't think that it only depends on, depended on John von Neumann's article. I think there was a, 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 a very uh, intensive flow of ideas at that time in America. Yes? Uh, yeah, sorry. I've actually read a, a book some time ago published by the Science Museum um, called Turing's Legacy, yeah. which suggested quite strongly that in fact Turing's influence on the ACE was, if anything, slightly negative because there were problems about what was the ideal mathematical solution to how you build the machine. So there were actually delays in creating the physical machine while there were arguments going on about how big the register should be, what position should be, and so on from the mathematical point of view. And that, that really very naughtily, 
one could argue that the best thing that happened to the ACE project was that Turing went to work in Manchester, <laughs> where he, he already had a working machine that he could then exploit, rather than worrying about the nitty-gritty details of the mathematics of the machine they were trying to build at NPL. But that well, well <laughs> the last sentence, I would underwrite that uh, uh, it may have speeded up uh, the build of the ACE machine that uh, Turing went away. Uh, but not, but maybe even a time, timely incident, but uh, giving new ideas while the machine is being built, you look at the analytical engine, you know what the outcome is. Mm. Uh, 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 on the other hand, uh, I would not believe that uh, he was uh, unpractical, uh, he was uh, frustrated that there were no resources uh, done to his machine, uh, a machine where he uh, said it must have 32 bit and it was a very <coughs> nice uh, uh, thing to use 30, 32 bits. Remember, we have just uh, some years ago uh, uh, moved uh, the, the personal computers to uh, 64 bits. Uh, 32 bits was for a long, long area the dominant uh, word size and uh, this was the ace at that time. And. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was a very practical, well, he was a mixture of practical and, and theoretical man. I remember one uh, sentence where someone wrote, uh, where one of the engineers said, well, we might have reflections in the mercury delay lines. Uh, and Turing said, okay, that's an interesting problem. And he thought that Turing would set up a, a workbench to experiment with it, like he would do. But Turing went back to his uh, calculating desk and calculated with waveforms and uh, uh, differential, uh, differential equations, something I would, <laughs> is beyond my uh, facilities, uh, whether there would be any reflection. And if you read, really read his report, it is written to the detail, as I said, even with the tube amplifiers and so on. I think the thing, the, the case that the ACE was built so late was purely bureaucratic and he was fed up with it. And I cannot uh, follow this uh, statement from the Science Museum at all. Well, no, that was my interpretation. Of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame anyone else, just blame me. Um, I wasn't quite sure how many of these machines actually exist. And you, you talked about not being investigated and not being engineered yet. Does that mean that they exist but you can't turn them on because you don't know what they exactly. do? Exactly. The only one of these, I think, private were, uh, we have uh, the Casimir, the old one, the mini one, <coughs> the, uh, the, the register machine, and the TTI machine, yeah, five. Only the mid, uh, the uh, uh, mini one uh, is fully engineered. It is still working. This video was taken, by the way, last week. <laughs> but uh, maybe I have to uh, exchange some uh, electrolytic capacitors. There were some cases when it went not as, as smooth as it should. But the other ones, no, I have not yet analyzed them. Why, why do you need to analyze them to find out how to turn them on or what? Well, it, it's very uh, dangerous to turn a machine on you know nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> and it may be that this register transfer machine should work, but if you turn on it and makes a light on, what do you know about it? It is, it is just the same with the... This is a difference between uh, these Turing machines I showed you first. Uh, you can turn them on and you know what they're doing. So, with this, uh, um, using the Motorola uh, early uh, ICs, you have to know what it do, does to, do, to, to find out whether it works correctly. Right. Yes, I can switch it on, yes, so what, it, what helps? Yeah? I'm sure it will uh, go. And uh, it, uh, Well, I must say, I first discovered the schematics for the uh, mini one, and then switched it on. <coughs> uh, so after I knew, fell, fairly well what, what, what to expect when I switch it on, I switched it on and I would like to do the same with all the other machines. I think the TTL machine will never be evaluated, it's much too complicated and uh, I still have to sort out his uh, heritage notes that he ha had left, they were not properly numbered, you know there are other researchers who make this very properly, he didn't and uh, because he thought this was not his uh, main research. You know he has published uh, books about computability with Scholz made uh, uh, very honestly scientific books and this was in a certain uh, sense his hobby 
and so we didn't emphasize it, and uh, that's the reason why we haven't. Um, do they all exist in the Paderborn Museum? They are now all in the Paderborn Museum. Uh, part of them were uh, preserved by uh, Dieter Redding's mother. Uh, I said that Dieter Redding uh, died rather early. And uh, the, uh, this mini one was uh, in his house in uh, Plettenberg. And uh, there we came about, uh, around it with a I think uh, Robert Riska had the context for it because it should go to Oxford, uh, to Cambridge. And uh, so we said, oh, could we have a look at it before? <laughs> before it goes, it, it goes on the long travel, not switched on. It was not switched on there. It was switched on half a year later when uh, I had a presentation uh, when the German uh, Association for Computing, uh, for, for, uh, the Deutsche Vereinigung for Logicians and Mathematicians, uh, who, who, of whom uh, Hasenjäger was the founder, had a conference and then I had the first time shown it to the public. And uh, I must admit, because I want to have some holidays here, I didn't carry it with me <laughs> and leave it in the hotel. That was a bit too dangerous. Okay, thank, thank you. Yes, sir. Any more questions or comments? Well, Raila, thank you very much indeed for coming here and giving us such a lucid presentation, which we've all appreciated, and your answers, and to you for comments and questions. So thank you very much. For